who was Carrie Johnson and what was her big lie. Yeah, that was it, that she was Candidate Secretary. <laughs> that was a, as big a lie as she could possibly tell. Although uh, when you look at her life and even the testimony of her own grandkids, she was a serial pathological liar. That's just what she did. And she was a, a classic sociopath as well. Um, Real quick, was, Steve. Yeah. One thing you said there, just because I don't want it to get buried. When you speak about her grandkids, who are you talking about and why are you referencing them? Because I think one of them uh, has something to do with your book. Yeah. Yeah. She's listed as a contributor. Nancy Page is her name. And it's actually because of her that I decided to write the book. When I was doing my uh, daily Facebook uh, thread, she was on and I got to know her. And I was fascinated that she was Carrie Johnson's granddaughter and was very interested in the things she was saying. So I did an extensive interview with her that I recorded. And I said, you know, there's material here that really needs to be explored and examined. And uh, I, I think it's worthy of a book. And um, she was, saying, yeah, 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 great. Others have said it's worthy of a book, but nothing ever happens. But I was serious about it. And, um, you know, she uh, was a great contributor and her brother. And um, it, it was just something that um, if it hadn't been for them, you know, as, I, as I've written many times, if it wasn't for Nancy Page and it wasn't for Norman Dowdy, uh, I could have never written that book. Those two witnesses were so important and so powerful that uh, the book could not have been written without them. So uh, I owe a great debt of gratitude to both of them. Of course, Dowdy's no longer with us, but Nancy is. And uh, she was with me on in the interview uh, with Peter Dixon on uh, SDA Q&A. But um, generally speaking, you know, she doesn't like to be out in public, I, she doesn't consider herself a public speaker particularly, and um, so I, I'll do most of the interviews myself. But um, you know, her her grandmother was uh, a thief. She uh, was kicked out of the Adventist Church for stealing church funds, and um, she she was a typical sociopath. She could butter up people that she wanted to impress and get close to just like Ellen White could. But it, at the root, at the core, there was evil there and a mistreatment of her grandkids. She exploited them. She abused them. Um, she was an opportunist, always looking for an opportunity to uh, benefit herself at the expense of others. And uh, she made her grandkids do all the work for a uh, apartment she rented that she got paid for and she never gave them a cent for painting it and cleaning up all the messes and crap and everything that was involved with that. Uh, Nancy goes into detail in the interview. But, um, you know, she was just a, a, a sick person. Um, she really had a major pathology and major dishonesty. And, um, you know, after all possible witnesses are dead, uh, she comes up with this claim. And, and I think the reason she came up with it was because she was close to uh, Andrews and she knew Arthur White came to Andrews and he was the head of the whole White estate nationally. And uh, she was a, a clever conniving kind of person and uh, she'd heard, she was in Battle Creek a short time, and she'd heard of Can Wright um, when she was young. And now she realized, hey, everybody's dead that can possibly uh, testify against this story. So she just completely creates the story, knowing that Arthur White's going to probably want to jump at something like this, because Can Wright's such a hated person, and his influence was getting greater, not less, with the other churches. This was a period when Adventism were being completely renounced as a cult. So uh, in 1950, she introduces herself to Arthur White and claims she was Canwright's secretary. And he goes crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah, we got to get your witness. We got to get your testimony. 
oh, you got to write a book about this. And, you know, it's a, s a fairly small book. It's something you could write in a year, especially if you're just speaking out of your own personal testimony. But obviously she wasn't. Uh, you know, Arthur White could see very quickly that she didn't have the good. She didn't have the personal experiences. She didn't even know how long she worked for the guy. She claimed different times, two years, 18 months, uh, seven months is what it finally came down to. But those seven months can be proven to be absolutely false. <laughs> that Canwright wasn't even there. You know, he, he had his own secretary that it was his next door neighbor. Uh, there was absolutely no way that she was his secretary. But then the book also proves that there was no way that she ever even met the man because she claimed to his family and to Dowdy that she saw that he had a peg leg when she knew him, uh, which was completely false. What she had tried to do was do research on Canwright when she came up with this lame brain idea. And she either mixed Canwright up with one of his relatives who had a peg leg or she believed a false rumor that Canwright had lost his leg in a hayfield accident when he was a kid, because that's what she told the family. You know, how stupid can you be to tell a man's own family that he had a peg leg when they know that he didn't? <laughs> and, uh, and all the neighbors, all the witnesses that Dowdy brings out in the book all say, you know, she's completely crazy. Uh, he had two good legs. He worked hard on those legs. The other possibility, which I doubt that this was her confusion, but before he died, Canwright had an accident shortly before he died in 1919, and he had to have a leg amputated. But her, her claim to Canwright's family was that he had lost his leg in a hay accident, which was the false rumor that had been spread. And uh, so she simply bought that false rumor and, and didn't, didn't admit where she got it from. She claimed it as fact that she'd actually seen this when she worked for Canwright. So, you know, the woman is so discredited in a million different ways. It's like Dowdy said, she lied when there was no benefit in lying. She just plain couldn't tell the truth. Uh, she couldn't speak without... <laughs> misrepresenting the truth no matter what she was saying and uh, so she was just a pathological liar and um, once uh, Arthur White realized this and realized that Canwright didn't have a peg leg and that she was completely deluded and that uh, you know she didn't know what she was talking about he didn't want to let go of the idea hey we got Canwright here we have a woman who's willing to claim she was his secretary so let's run with this and just create the story ourselves. So he meets with her on a regular basis for 20 years and basically tells her what to write. And uh, her grandkids witness this. And um, so, you know, it's really all about Arthur White. He's really the one who wrote the book. He's really the one who got it published. Um, this is much more about Arthur White than Carrie Johnson because she's an, really just a criminal and an evil person that had no standing anywhere. Whereas Arthur White was the head of the White estate. That's quite a big difference. Here right. you have the head of the White estate stealing a diary, colluding with Carrie Johnson to keep, they both denied ownership so they could keep the diary in the white estate which is it's there to this very day i mean they're thieves they're liars they're arthur white should be discredited from every award he was given he should have the honorary doctorate taken away from andrews he should be cut off from the white estate for all the years he, he should be uh, discredited as the biog biographer of his grandmother all six volumes that the church considers the official biography. I mean, this man is is an embarrassment, and uh, it's an embarrassment to the White Estate that he represented them all those years, and none of them are owning it. You know, right? They they want to do the usual. Let's just cover it up and pretend it's not real. Yeah.
which it's like it's not 1980 anymore, folks. Yep. <laughs> it's a it's a different era. So who all who all was involved in I was Ken Wright's secretary? You mentioned Kerry Johnson and Arthur White. Was it just those two? They were the two that put the whole thing together. And no one even knew about Arthur White being involved except for Carrie Johnson and her grandkids. So I'm very thankful that I was able to get the witness of her grandkids before they pass on because right. they're getting up in years. So, Well, and you mentioned, too, the, the diary, which you talk about this a lot more in depth in the book. But for those in the audience who may not know about that, what exactly was going on with that? Because that's kind of a... a, a a key link in the whole product actually coming about. They, they needed that diary in order to, uh, to, to bring this yeah. whole thing about. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah. Once Arthur realized that Carrie never even met Ken, right? Much less worked for him. Uh, he didn't want to let go of the story, but he realizes that Carrie has nothing to offer him except lies. So now he has to try to build a story on, uh, filler that he generates and then he says but there has to be some kind of personal information here if you actually work for the guy so you need to get a hold of his diary and uh arthur was aware that he had a diary out there uh in the family so he uh puts Carrie up to going out and meeting with the family members getting to know them making them believe that she's writing this great sympathetic biography of can Wright and that she loves the guy and she honored him at his grave and he has a street named after him and he was this great wonderful person and she just wants the whole world to know about it never tells him she's coming from the adventist never tells him what her true motives are um so she completely lies and deceives them uh and gets uh, the relatives to allow her to borrow the diary. It was supposed to just be borrowing for a short time so she could go through it and, and uh, take material that would be helpful to making Canwright look like a great man. Uh, as soon as she gets her hands on that diary, which she'd been trying to do for some time, uh, Nancy says she was the happiest person in the world. She went straight to Arthur White. This was their deal. She handed it to him. He locked it in the White Estate. Dowdy and the family demanded it back as soon as they realized uh, that they'd been duped and deceived. And uh, and Arthur White refused to give it to them. He tried to stonewall them forever. And then he said, well, this isn't our property. It's, it's uh, the property of Johnson. You'll have to talk to her. So then they go to Carrie Johnson and she says, no, no, I gave it to the White Estate. I don't own it anymore. And that's the arrangement that Arthur and Carrie worked out. We'll both deny ownership. Therefore, they can't get the diary back. And it's still in the possession of the White Estate today because of that lie, because of that theft. And... Um, uh, what they really planned on doing was now we can make up anything and attribute it to uh, Canwright's diary because we're the only ones that have access to it. The problem was that Norman Dowdy was a very shrewd, smart guy, and he insisted on at least being able to read the diary. Um, they wouldn't allow him to take any notes. They wouldn't allow him to make any copies. But just the fact that he read it uh, he made it clear in his book in 1964 that there was absolutely nothing in that diary that was harmful to Canwright. So that really threw a major brick in their plans because they wanted to make up all kinds of lies. And when Carrie Johnson went out on the camp meeting circuit as the big Adventist celebrity, she made up all kinds of lies and attributed them to the diary and stuff. But uh, they weren't in print, so it was a lot harder to uh, for people to know about it. But the Adventist audiences were eating it up. There's still one of those interviews on the Internet to this day that I have uh, referenced in the book that you can go. And she's just disgusting. I mean, she's saying Canwright was completely demon possessed. He spoke in these demonic voices when he was trying to 
dictate to her. And I mean, you couldn't be any more asinine than what she is. But she, you know, the Adventists were just eating it up because this is their public enemy number one. Ah, he was demon possessed. He was the exorcist. Oh, wow. No wonder you criticized Ellen White. He was straight from the devil. You know, this kind of stupidity. When Canwright was actually a man of integrity, an honest man, a sincere man, a lover of God, a believer in the gospel, and Arthur White and Kerry Johnson were the opposite, which Adventism in general tends to be the opposite. Now, Steve, you know what the Adventist response, other people will hear that, but you know what the Adventist response is going to be. To that. And, and it's going to be, well, that was Kerry and Arthur or the White Estate, not the SDA organization. That's just individuals. Of course, individuals are flawed, et cetera. How has the SDA church gone about propagating and promoting this lie? Because has the SDA church, do they have any blood on their hands when it comes to Absolutely. I was Canwright's secretary? Absolutely. That was the greatest book ever for the church. They promoted it like mad. The Review and Herald completely prostituted itself. It didn't even vet the book. It just took Arthur White's word for it. So they would have been subject to such a ridiculous libel suit um, that you can't even comprehend. And it could have brought down the whole SDA church because the whole church was promoting this book, promoting her as a celebrity at all their camp meetings, telling her lies. They were recorded lies that could have stood up in court. Um, you know, they dodged a bullet, basically. Uh, the church, Review and Herald, White Estate, it all could have been taken down by the stupidity that Arthur White engaged in. And uh, the Adventist church is so good at covering things up and they live in their own little isolated uh, subculture away from the rest of the world and accountability to the press and all these kinds of things that, um, you know, they just lie. They lie and they lie and they lie. And uh, they're going to try to lie their way through this in whatever way they can. But the whole church was involved in this and the, the book is still being published today. You know, it's unbelievable that they're still promoting this and advertising this as if it's truth, even after my book's already out. 